Come on back. It's over there, I got to cut it. It's a drone camera. Hey, look me over, lend me an ear. Fresh out of clover, mortgage up to here. But don't pass the plate, folks, don't pass the cup. I when you're down, I'll raise up and I'll be up like a rosebud high on the vine. Don't thumb your nose, but take a tip from mine. I'm a little shorty, I'm a rumble, let me get me some. So look out, world, here I come. Here I come. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are the Chorus of DuPage, Men's Barbershop Chorus, and we're here very proud to be part of this. And we'd like to sing a few songs for you from the era. Next song. Pass me by. Mary Lou. Pass me by one summer day, flash those big brown eyes my way, and oh, I wanted you forevermore. Now, well, baby, I'm not one that gets around, swear my feet's up to the ground, and though I never did meet you before, I said hello, Mary Lou. So hello, Mary Lou, goodbye, heart, goodbye, heart. Saw your lips, I heard your voice, believe me, I just had no choice. My horses could make me stay away. Thought about a moonlit night, arms around you, good and tight. That's all I need to see for me to stay. Hey, hey, hello, Mary Lou. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can you all hear me okay? I want, I want to tell you about, uh, I want to tell you a little, little story about the gentleman who went to have his hearing aids fixed, and he had, got fitted, and it was really great. He came back about 30 days later, and the doctor was like, oh my goodness, you must be so proud. It's amazing, you can hear 100%. I'll bet your family is very proud of this. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I haven't even told my family. I just sit around all the time and I listen to all the conversations. You know, I've changed my will three times already. <laughs> it's always fun to have love at home, and we'd like to share this next song with you. Every side, time. 
just softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home. Love at home. Love at home. Time the softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home All our loved ones drawing nigh As we raise our voices high Blessed are we and we <laughs> getting those calf muscles in shape here. Um, so we are the course of DuPage of the Barbershop Harmony Society. We meet in Naperville and we are so proud to be here. We do many events like this. We meet at the VFW Hall in Naperville. Um, if any of you are interested in singing or in coming to one of our rehearsals, we rehearse on Wednesday nights. So that would be tomorrow. So you can get more music than you're getting right now by coming tomorrow um, to the VFW Hall in, in Naperville. We, we start at 7 and we go till about 9.30. And then we may go even further if the mood strikes us. Down the canteen. Um, yeah, down in the canteen. I'm being reminded by these guys. Aren't they great? <laughs> So we heard that there was a very special presentation going to be made today about a book that was written about some very special letters. And I'm sure every single one of the veterans in the room has a memory about some special letters that went back and forth that kept us in connection with each other. This next song we'd like to share in honor of our speaker today. Your 
Okay. Again, we're very proud to be here, and we'd like to uh, leave you with one more song before the color guard comes in. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom, and they can't take that away. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the ones who died, who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston and New York to L.A., well, there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say, hey, hey, and I'm proud to be an American. Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA Thank you very much, the chorus of DuPage. Thank you, gentlemen. I was a bit surprised because what I saw on the program last night that was sent to me was COD, so I was thinking College of DuPage. <laughs> and to my surprise and happiness, we have the chorus of DuPage. Thank you again, gentlemen. It is now time for me to uh, welcome you and to call the colors. Sergeant of Arms, please bring the colors forward. Please remain standing while the chorus of DuPage sings the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming 
broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet Sergeant of Arms, please retire the colors. Please be seated. My name is Jack Person. I'm immediate past president of Naperville Response for Veterans. And I want to welcome you here today. Thank you very much. We have over 500 people. Many of them are veterans. And what we'd like to do right now with the help of the, co uh, the chorus of DuPage is to represent and acknowledge each branch of the service. The chorus of DuPage is going to sing a medley of songs. Each branch, when you hear your song, please rise and be acknowledged. Applause or welcome. Thank you, folks. From the rising of the sun till the battles fought and won, we will fight for the right and defend our country. We're always ready for the call. We place our trust in Thee. Through surf and storm and howling gale, I shall our purpose be. Semper Paratus is our guide, our pledge, our motto too. We're always ready, do or die. Start, we fight for you da, 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 da. from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We will fight our country's battle in the air on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marine. Ba -da -ba -ba. Anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to college joys, we sail at break of day. Through our last night on shore, Drink to the foam, and till we meet once more, here's wishing you a happy voyage home. First to fight for the right, and to fill the nation's might, and the army goes rolling along, rolls along. Out of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won, and the army goes rolling along. Along, and it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way 
Count off the cadence loud and strong. For where'er we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along, along. Off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here come, soon to meet our thunder. And a boys, give her the gun, give her the gun. Down we die, stopping our flames from under. Off with one hell of a roar. We live in fame, we're down in flame. Hey, nothing can stop the U.S. Air Force. And those are the great armed forces of America. They serve America and home or overseas. They serve America. Let's hear that for the chorus of DuPage. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. They'll be back later in the program to close us out. <clears throat> it's with uh, great pleasure that I get to introduce the next gentleman, who's also a past president of Naperville Response, Mr. Pat Bowler. Would you please come to the podium? Wow, how about it? 13 years ago we started this, look what happened. We were talking about this earlier, our first uh, breakfast was 13 years ago at the VFW, and now we've grown to over 500 at this event. So, so glad to see everybody, familiar faces that we've seen year after year. Uh, we certainly appreciate all we do. And being a past president, I kind of know what it's like to put things together and get things rolling. Um, this organization has grown tremendously, as you know. We do a lot of good things for veterans throughout the uh, uh, Naperville area. Um, before I introduce our president, I'm going to ask all of our volunteers, board members, honorary board members, this, there's a lot of moving parts here, and I want you to stand up and at least be recognized, because we do a lot. Stand up, board members, honorary board members, volunteers, there they are. This thing works like you can't believe. Look at them all. Yes. Thank you. Now, once again, being president is tough. But when you're working with so many moving parts, Dan Jerzevic has been with us probably five years now as president. He's one of our founding members also. He started early with us. And not only does he have a lot going on? Four children, his wife, Nicole. The time he puts in here is incredible. I wouldn't be surprised to say he gets at least five phone calls a day regarding all the different moving parts we've had. So I can't tell you enough how much we appreciate his leadership and what he's done with this organization. Dan, come on up here. Thank you, Pat. Uh, and I'm glad that Pat had an opportunity to address the room. Obviously, we're all here today because of the folks like Pat that got this whole thing started. So thank you guys that have been here from the beginning. Uh, good afternoon. On behalf of our entire board of directors, I'd like to welcome you to our 11th annual Strength and Honor Luncheon. Uh, we had a couple years off there. That's why it's 11th. But 13 years ago, we did have the first one. Uh, our organization, as Pat mentioned, continues to grow in the number of annual projects that we do and the uh, number of dollars that we're able to dedicate towards our veteran projects. Despite numerous challenges in 2021, Naperville Response for Veterans was incredibly productive, directing $248,900 to home repair and modification for veterans in need. This type of effort is only made possible by a 100% volunteer board of directors that has an intense passion for the mission of serving veterans. Uh, we're here today for the broader mission of simply saying thank you and to honor the hundreds of veterans that are in attendance with us. My passion for serving veterans, if we get his photo up there, began with this guy. 
George Francis Griffin was a World War II Army veteran, a father of 10, and my grandfather. George was a true gentleman, one of the toughest, most authentic, and genuinely great human beings I've ever known. And like many in his generation, George was the grandchild of immigrants. He grew up in Chicago with very little other than school and sports, family and friends. George was a competitive guy and worked extremely hard at St. Phillips High School, ultimately earning an opportunity to attend and play basketball at St. Ambrose University in Iowa. This life-changing opportunity for George to attend college began in the fall of 1942, but was short-lived when he was drafted into the Army in February of 1943 joining the 503rd Parachute Infantry. From the fall of 1943 until the end of 1945, George and the 503rd fought throughout Papua New Guinea on their way to the Philippines, where they ultimately played a critical role in liberating the island. George, like so many of the brave men and women in this room, embarked on his service at the age of 18, answering the call, fighting for freedom, defending our country. And that's pretty profound when you think about what most people are doing between the ages of 18 and 21. So whenever I think I'm having a tough time, things aren't going my way or life isn't fair, I think about my grandfather and I think about all the men and women who serve. That'll change your perspective pretty quickly. I'm eternally grateful for all the veterans in our room, all the veterans who served, and for all of our active military. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of new guests that we have to this event for the first time this year. Up front, we have Max Bednarenko. You guys can acknowledge Max. Max is a lifetime Naperville guy. He left for Camp Pendleton the day after he graduated from Naperville North High School, and he's been serving for the past four years in Okinawa. We also have a family to welcome up front here. We have Navy veteran Mike Bailey. Mike is joined by his daughter, Rena, who is an Army specialist, and his son, Liam, who just graduated from Camp Pendleton on Saturday. I know for a fact we have a couple of World War II veterans in attendance today. I know we have Dick Miller and we've got Don O'Reilly at the ripe old age of 100 years old. Don is still ushering uh, my kids into church at Saints Peter and Paul. And any World War II veterans that are in attendance today, if you're able to, please stand and be recognized. As we heard earlier, we have a wonderful featured speaker today, Kathy Nosick, author of the book, My Darling, 99 Love Letters, which chronicles love letters written by her father to her mother during his service in World War II. And today we're also honored to be joined by the cousin of another distinguished World War II veteran who we recently lost, Tuskegee Airman Melvin Copeland. At this time, please join me in welcoming Lorraine Shoto, who will share a little more on the legacy of her cousin, Mr. Melvin Copeland. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start, we're going to watch a short uh, video about Melvin. Give me something I can do to phrase my love for America. On a fall 2020 Honor Flight Chicago podcast, World War II veteran Melvin Copeland telling our Paul Mikey he was still looking to serve his country. The Elgin man died Friday at 96 after what loved ones describe as a remarkable life. As a, a black man of, of his generation, li literally lived through you know some of um, the worst you know discrimination in our history, and and he wasn't going to Melvin wasn't the type to sit by and take it. In 1943, he left a college athletic scholarship to join the army, where Sergeant Copeland became a trailblazing Tuskegee Airman. Too tall to be a pilot, he helped load ammunition onto those iconic red tail fighters, even as Jim Crow followed him to the European theater. 
I said, these guys are like family. If you got one or two in there that don't like black people, that's part of what you have to live with. After the war, Copeland spent four decades teaching in Elgin, before cousin Lorraine Shoto says he spent another 20 years as a social worker, always looking to help his community. And there are a lot of serious and uh, real barriers that you know, may prevent you, but you, but you can at least lend your voice to the fight. And Shoto says this tenacious hero will soon be honored at the Abraham Lincoln National Cemetery. So as you heard, I'm Lorraine Shoto. Melvin Copeland was my mom's only first cousin. My maternal grandmother's sister was Melvin's mother, my great aunt Ruth. Melvin was very close with my mom and her siblings growing up, and he was always a big part of my life. I'm very happy and humbled to be here today on behalf of Melvin and our family. Before sharing more with you about our, my cousin, I want to start by expressing my thanks to Naperville Response for Veterans and everyone involved in putting this wonderful event together. Your dedication to making this day special and your kindness are deeply appreciated. I also want to thank the Gustins, Greg and Patty. I know that you wanted to this honor for Melvin for a long time, and I'm so glad that you, Patty, had a chance to talk to him while he was still with us. I also want to thank and, and recognize some very special longtime friends of Melvin's who are here today, Carla Kahn, and also his veteran friends from the Edgewater Veterans uh, from Elgin, Illinois. It means so much that you're here. Thank you. Melvin would have loved being in this room the company of his fellow veterans and the, the bonds of brotherhood shared were something that he very much treasured. To his friends, he was just Mel. But to our family, he was always Melvin, with the exception of his mother, my, my great aunt, who always called him Sonny. Anyone who knew Melvin knew that he didn't like to talk about himself or brag very much. He was always much more interested and hearing about what was going on in the lives of others, or just talking about the sports that he loved, books, old Western movies, or jazz. It was even better if those conversations were held at one of his favorite diners or at an Ethiopian restaurant. Melvin always said, if you don't use it, you lose it. He believed in being on the go and in motion. And since he was just a couple months shy of his 97th birthday when he passed away, I think it's safe to say that that philosophy served him pretty well. Melvin was on the move his entire life. When he did talk about his military service, he would let you know that he wasn't drafted. He volunteered because he wanted to go and serve. And that was not a decision that was welcomed at his house. He was just 18 years old, with a college scholarship in hand. He wasn't supposed to be going to war. And my, my great aunt Ruth was terrified, just like you, can, you know that any mother and every mother would be in that situation. But her fears were even more compounded by the very real uncertainties that she had about entrusting her only son, a black son, to a military that she was not sure would look out for him. She and her husband, Robert Copeland had moved to Ohio from Mississippi to escape voting and other discrimination. But like so many others at that time, their fears coexisted right alongside with their immense hopes for the future that were rooted in, their, in the promise of America and its opportunities. Those hopes were instilled in Melvin from a very early age. He would say, I joined the Army because I love this country. I love what he said in the clip that you just saw, that he wanted to find a way to phrase his love for America. The high school that Melvin and most of my family in Toledo attended was predominantly Jewish um, student body at the, at the, during those years. And one of Melvin's closest friends was a young Jewish man who enlisted at the same time that he did. 
he said that they both wanted to serve as paratroopers. I guess that was their teenage idea of where the action was and how you could really be involved in fighting for, for the country. But it wasn't long before Melvin realized that joining the paratrooper regiments was not an option for him as an African-American soldier. Although black Americans had served in every conflict throughout our nation's history, American military service during World War II was laden with severe restrictions, segregation, and racism for the black men and women who served. Melvin routinely experienced those harsh realities, even as he sought to serve his country. One experience that he had shook him to his core and stayed with him for the rest of his life. That high school friend of his uh, who had joined at the same time, he, Melvin learned he was badly injured. He'd broken his leg very badly in a training exercise, and he was in need of blood. So Melvin immediately offered his blood and let the officers know that they were the same blood type. But Melvin's offer was categorically denied because he was told that he couldn't give blood for, to a white man. Melvin was furious, and he knew from that time that he would always stand up for what was right whenever possible. He understood deeply that his love for America meant that he could not be silent. It meant that he could not turn a blind eye to its imperfections and injustices. So I imagine that it must have been a feeling of unimaginable, um, a, a sense of promise and joy for Melvin to be able to, to serve the country in the way that he had initial, initially uh, imagined and envisioned when in late 1943, he was ordered to report to the Tuskegee Army Airfield in Alabama for aviation training. But standing six foot five and weighing 175 pounds at the time of his enlistment, Melvin was what I'm sure that even then they called a bean pole. <laughs> he said that when he went and he first sat in one of the fighter airplanes, the canopy could not close due to his height. There have been stories written about him, I think, that say that the, the, the red tail who was too tall to fly. Once again, though, Melvin refused to let any obstacle get in his way. Instead, he earned his carbine marksman badge and did extensive ammunition training that he used to become a munition specialist assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group. That squadron would go on to famously be known as the Red Tails. Melvin shipped out to the European Theater of Operations in early 1944. By then, the 332nd was flying out of airfields in Tunisia, Italy, and Sicily. His job was loading munitions on fighters that flew bomber escort missions into the heart of German-occupied Europe. The distinguished Red Tails, who had emerged from the segregated grounds of Tuskegee, Alabama, broke down barriers for black pilots and air crews everywhere. They flew more than 15,000 air raids, destroyed nearly 300 enemy aircraft, and were awarded more than 850 medals. Prior to his honorable discharge from the Army, Melvin attained the rank of sergeant. He recalled, when I got off the ship and the war was over, I stepped off and kissed the ground because I was proud to be an American. That was on May 24, 1945, 17 days after Germany's unconditional surrender. Service to his country and his community was in Melvin's DNA. He, he continued to shape his life after he got home from the war. After arriving back at home in Ohio, he finished his bachelor's degree and went on to earn two master's degrees in education and clinical therapy. Melvin moved to Illinois and was a dedicated teacher in Elvin's U46 school district for more than 30 years. While working in Elgin, he also taught classes at Elgin Community College, and he served as a contract clinical therapist with the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. Inspiring and guiding young people was truly the joy of Melvin's life. Although he didn't talk much about his military service, it was clear that some of the horrors that he had seen of war 
created in him an enormous sense of empathy for young people who were struggling in their lives. For Melvin, retiring was like abandoning his duties. So even after a long career teaching, he continued to work with foster children as a social worker, even being named Social Worker of the Year by the Illinois chapter of the National uh, Association of Social Workers when he was 77 years old. He finally retired for real when he was 90. <laughs> he was also involved in the civil rights movement and served as a leader in his local NAACP chapter. Melvin had such passion for life and the things he loved. He was a man of great faith who loved his family. He took exceptionally good care of his wife who, had, who suffered from early onset Alzheimer's until she passed away. Melvin formed true friendships that he deeply cherished, and I know that those relationships, some with people who are here with us today, sustained him. Melvin pursued his passions with a zeal that is rarely seen. He was a voracious reader. He loved engaging in discussions about everything. And despite multiple bouts with cancer, one of which severely diminished the use of his right arm, Melvin learned to play tennis as a lefty at age 80. They truly don't make them like that anymore. I'm so grateful that a man like Melvin Copeland was one of the people who helped to raise and shape me. Melvin would have considered this a tremendous honor because being recognized among veterans and patrons was something that would have meant the world to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorraine. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'd like to welcome Naperville Response for Veterans' very own Mike Barber up to the stage for the POW table presentation. You may have noticed the small table set in a place of honor. It is set for one. This table is our way of recognizing those who are missing from our midst. They are commonly called POWs or MIAs. We call them brothers. They are unable to be here with us, so we remember them. This table set for one is small. It symbolizes the frailty of one prisoner against his oppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep faith awaiting their return. The yellow ribbon tied so prominently on the vase, is reminiscent of the yellow ribbon worn by the thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting for our missing. A slice of lemon is on the plate to remind us of their bitter fate. There is salt upon the plate, symbolic of the family tears as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us today. The chair, the chair is empty. They are not here. Remember, all of you who served with them and called them comrades, you who depended on their might and aid and relied upon them, do not forsake them. Pray for them and remember them. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Please welcome Father Dan Bachner up to the stage for the invocation. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus entered through the locked doors, and his first words to the disciples was, peace be with you. And if they didn't hear it the first time, he repeated it again, peace be with you. It's a great honor and privilege to offer this invocation for the men and women who have continued through time and through the century to continue to build up peace in our world, who have selflessly given of their lives, their careers, to follow in the footsteps of Christ. And so it is an honor as we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Abba Father, we turn to you as we celebrate this day honoring our veterans, those men and women who have so selflessly gave of themselves in this world and in this one lifetime. We ask you, Lord, to bless them, bless their families, bless those who are broken and need healing. Bring them peace, Lord, in their hearts, in their minds, and in their lives. And especially, Lord, we pray for peace in Ukraine, that the violence may come to an end and love between men mankind may continue to build up your kingdom of peace and justice and love. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, folks, as uh, lunch is coming out, I want to go ahead and introduce our featured speaker of the day. If you join me in welcoming Kathy Nosick. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, you guys. I'm sorry to interrupt your lunch, but we're going to get going. And I am so honored to be here today to talk to all of you. I had a little bit of a different beginning planned until this morning. And I have to tell you, I'm a person that looks for signs. <laughs> and this morning I'm walking around my house and I'm hot and I'm changing clothes because I'm thinking I'm gonna sweat up here <laughs> knowing that all those tables I saw yesterday were gonna be filled. And I went outside just to cool off with my two dogs and in my yard, is a male and a female duck. Finally, I call them Mary and Bernie. <laughs> they are my parents. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like the perfect sign. I haven't seen them yet this year. And it was just them wishing me good luck and giving me permission to share their story. It's a little late, I already wrote a book, but. <laughs> Uh, this is a little different, but, and then this morning, I'm in real estate, not a plug, just some information, and I accepted a contract this morning, and it was a VA loan, and what could be better? <laughs> so, so excited about that. I'm so honored again to be here. I come from a great family and a lot of history with people that have served. In the screen right now are pictures of my maternal and paternal grandfather, William Runke and Louis Kincannon. They served in World War I. In this picture is my great-grandmother with her three sons. Circled in the middle is Leslie. Leslie was a soldier in the Army in World War I, and he was killed in France and buried there. My great-grandmother Julia, Leslie's mother, was a part of a pilgrimage that the government put together for women, wives, and mothers. They were a pilgrimage of gold star mother and wives. <clears throat> and Leslie 
Leslie's mom took that pilgrimage. The identification card you see there is on the back is um, written in French. And this is actually her identification card that I found when I was doing research for my book. This is her actual passport. Her trip was completed in May of 1930. 17,389 women were eligible to do this pilgrimage. And by October 31st of 1933, the pilgrimage ended and only 6,693 women were on that ship, or it was more than one ship. My brother and an uncle served in the Navy. The picture up on the screen is actually the USS LaSalle that my brother was on for nearly three years. And this is my dad. He was a World War II Army from 1942 to 1945. Pictured with him is my mom, Mary. Most everything that I know about my dad and his service came years after he had passed away. March 6th, 1942. I left your house most every time looking like a wild man. March 11th, 1942. Darling, I'm in an awful fix. My mind is full of pleasant thoughts of you, but somehow they won't come out and form a sentence. Take care of yourself and think of me a little because I've fallen in love with you. April 7th, 1942. By the way, you're my first darling in my life, also the last. I'm speechless, dumb, and dumbfounded. I have always hoped for a complete love of a good, decent girl. This is my daddy. <laughs> March 16th, 1943. Talking about songs, you made me love you. Hits me right on the nose. Do you know I never believed in love until now? April 15th, 1943. Consider everything and not just your heart alone. If I had listened to mine, you'd have been a bride months ago. That's how much I love you. But there happens to be a few barriers up now, and one of them is spelled war. These are quotes from love letters my dad wrote to my mom between 1942 and 1945. It was a time of war, and a new love was blooming. May I introduce to you Mary Eileen Runke and Louis Bernard Kincannon. <laughs> Sorry. Fondly called Bernie. Mom was 19 years old and dad was 24. It was 1942. How they met is an awesome story, and I'm going to call it destiny or fate. But as it was, mom and dad and my mother's best friend, June, all worked together at the same factory in Chicago. It was called Modern Modes. It was a dress form factory. Now, June, knowing my mother the way she did, knew that my mother was a crazy Cub fan. She was a bleacher bum from the early 1930s, and she would go there with her little brother at any chance they could and be at Wrigley Field. And June pointed out this guy from across the factory room floor and told her that he was a minor league pitcher. And my mother, the rest almost is history here. But before I go on, I want to tell you a little bit about what my dad's legacy and what he has left behind. Dad played as a pitcher in the minor leagues for the Cubs and the Cleveland Indians and a few other teams. Because of his talent and his fastball, he played in special services division in the Army. Unfortunately, when he came home, he could not realize his dream because he hurt his arm pitching. Back in those days, they didn't tell or rest a pitcher's arm like they do today. He left behind a legacy of his talent. My older brother, Michael, was a coach for baseball and is in the Illinois Coaches Hall of Fame. My younger brother, Bill, was a minor league pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds. And currently, his son, William, is a pitcher in AA for the Chicago White Sox. So I go between the Cubs and the White Sox. <laughs> so who wouldn't like this guy? That great smile and that head of hair. 
I would have picked them out across the factory room floor too. <laughs> and my mom, she was a tall, dark-haired beauty with beautiful hazel eyes. As dad was warming up, the girls were heating up. And I'm talking about the kitchen, because it was a double date. It was a blind date for my dad. He had no idea what was going on. And June and Harry set this up, and mom and dad hit it off right away. So these pictures are from 1942 and their courtship, where dad was traveling and playing ball. He was in places like Kansas City, Florida, South Carolina. And there's a, a little picture up there in the top left-hand corner. That's his aunt. And she and Charlie had no children, so she would follow him everywhere. And I know my mom went on a couple of these uh, little trips to see dad pitch, but you know she was also a young girl that was working. So the first letter that I have from my father to my mother was dated April 7th, 1942. It was from the Harrington Hotel in Ocala, Florida. Less than one year later, March 25th, 1943, Dad was in the Army. The very first letter from the Army, he was Private Lewis B. Cannon, Anti-Tank Company, 424th Infantry in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And then there were letters and more letters and more letters. After many, many months apart, dozens and dozens of love letters, Dad went home on a furlough and married the love of his life, June 3rd, 1944. The wonderful thing about this picture, because I know my mom, and you, you know when you read a letter, you can almost tell what the person on the other side is writing? Well, my mom was pressuring my father for months long before this wedding actually happened. And when they finally said, Dad said, he's coming home, we'll get married. Mom had no idea what date that was, so she had to be prepared. And I give her a lot of credit, but it's not surprising if you knew my mother. The smiles on these two just make me so warm, and they are so happy. It's the first time and only time I think I see my dad with a picture with a wedding ring on. He never wore jewelry. But the dress my mom is wearing was her best friend June's, and it fit her like a glove. She's stunning. Dad's furlough lasted a couple months. His letters begin again in the middle of August. And Dad had one more short furlough in September 1944 before he went overseas. It actually says that on the picture, last photo before overseas. So October 26, 1944, this letter arrives, and it just states in there, the eastern part of the U.S. And I'm sure this is when he, they weren't able to tell people exactly where they were for security reasons. By November 2nd, 1944, Dad was somewhere overseas. Letters from overseas in November came fast and furious. He was a letter writer, and when he got down to being able to write, he wrote almost every day. November 4th, some of these quotes just, if, if you knew my dad who didn't say much, it says everything to me. November 4th, gosh, Mary, a guy can be in love, but he never knows how much until he is so darn far away. November 5th, after a day of army life, it is always a pleasure to relax and concentrate on you. November 6th, received two more letters from you today. They were swell. <laughs> November 11th, there must be a delay in the mail. I was lost until your letters started to arrive. November 15th, after another night here, so it's time to write the best wife a guy could have. November 21st, the waters get a bit rough at times, but so far I've escaped seasickness, which is something to be grateful for. November 23rd, happy Thanksgiving. November 25th, hello again, sweetest girl in the world. How is my wife? What a lucky guy this soldier is, just knowing you are there waiting for me. Over two weeks went by without a word from her husband. Then, on December 13th, Dad's somewhere in Germany. 
Now this is a thread in his letters that was very reoccurring. And you can see I've circled it up there, but it says, hoping that you wouldn't worry about not hearing from me because as usual, there's a good reason behind every delay in the mail. This became my mother's mantra. This letter dated January 15th, 1945, is the only letter that I have written by my mother. And she ended it in mid-sentence after three pages, and we have no idea why. My darling, well, honey, no mail again today. I keep remembering that you've said over and over again that if there is a delay in the mail, there is a good reason. I was thinking last night how lonesome it was here when you were in Kansas. But what was that compared to the loneliness we are feeling now? But I guess whenever, and then it just stops. Tonight, the Secretary of War released the casualty figures since December 16th, and darling, I could have cried when I saw them. When I think of all you boys over there and what you're going through, our prayers are with you always. Four months after Dad's last letter, dated December 13th, 1944, a letter arrived from the War Department, dated April 28th, 1945. My brother Michael was 16 days old. So on Daddy's furlough, Mom got pregnant. I don't think Dad even had a clue. <laughs> and he had a son, and no way of letting him know. The War Department letter says, Dear Mrs. Kincannon, there has been forwarded to this office from overseas your letter of inquiry concerning your husband, Corporate Louis B. Kincannon, who has been missing in action in Germany since 21 December 1944. Your distress since he was reported a casualty and your desire to obtain further information regarding him is most understandable. A report now available to the War Department shows that on 11 December 1944, the regiment in which your husband was ammunition handler moved up to a defensive position on the battle line in the vicinity of Ashad, Germany. On 16 December 1944, the German attack began, and on 18 December 1944, all communications with the regiment was lost. Available evidence indicates the regiment was surrounded by German units. I wish to assure you that upon receipt of any further information regarding your husband, it will be communicated to you immediately. It is regretted that the War Department has no further details as of 18 April 1945. My sympathy continues with you. Time just keeps ticking away, and I, all I can think of is my mother thinking there's a good reason for this delay, there's a good reason for this delay. But there was also the radio, and there was news, and so I don't know. My mother never talked about it and what she went through. So six months after Dad's last letter, June 1st, 1945, at 12.02 a.m., a telegram arrives. The Secretary of War desires me to inform you that your husband, technician, fifth grade, Lewis B. Cannon, returned to military control 11 May. Yes. Good thing or I wouldn't be here. <laughs> this is the Western Union telegram that my mother received. So what we found out is that my dad was a prisoner of war. He was captured at the Battle of the Bulge, and he was at Stalag 4B in Germany. This is his actual identification paper. This is the actual Stalag. It's amazing what you can find on the internet nowadays, but this is a picture of where my dad was being held for all those months. This picture is the same area, and it makes me cold just looking at it because you know, Daddy only told a couple stories. One was about the terrible food and the maggots in the soup. And the other story was about how cold he was. He said he'd never been colder than in his life than he was in this picture in Germany. 
So doing research for this book, my nephew got really involved as well, and he started looking online, 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 and he came across this dollar bill, and it was from the son of a guy named George Coleman that was captured at the Battle of the Bulge. And when my nephew sent it to me, right away, we saw my dad's signature right there. Louis L. Bernard Kincannon. He liked Bernie better, so the L was, he kind of disappeared. <laughs> but um, it was sad because mom and dad were both gone and we couldn't talk to them about this. We couldn't ask them. So dad is home. My dad returned home to his wife and three-month-old baby boy, Michael, in July of 1945, seven months after his capture. Then came the rest of us. So this picture is in front of the same church where mom and dad got married in Oak Park, Illinois. That's where we all grew up. This is in front of St. Edmund's Church. And my mother actually went to school there and then they got married there and Michael was baptized there. And the other picture where Michael's a little bit older, my mother actually is pregnant with her second child, my brother Larry, and all we, 13 months apart, so they got busy right away. And I came along six years later, so they figured it all out. <laughs> this is our Oak Park home that we lived in for 37 years. It was a great block. It was a great place to grow up. And it was hard leaving. We left that home in 1995. So this is the five of us. I'm right, where am I? I'm right in the middle there. <laughs> And this is us as adults. And as you can see, I am the runt of the litter. <laughs> All my siblings are very tall. I got the short gene. So mom and dad, this is a, a picture of them at their 50th wedding anniversary party, June 3rd, 1944, 1994. They renewed their vows and people came from all over the country. My sister in the pink next to me, she came in from Virginia, and uh, my mother's brother is behind her with his hands on her shoulder. He came in with his mother, who's in the wheelchair, my grandma, uh, from Florida. It was a surprise to my parents. They had no idea. It was a great time. So my dad was a very kind, gentle soul. He worked really hard for his family at a job he really didn't like. But you know, back in the day, these, these, a lot of these people, they had to take jobs because they didn't have the education, because they left their jobs to support their family during the Depression. So Daddy did the best that he could, but he was an avid reader. Right here is a picture, a typical picture of my father is with a book in his hand, falling asleep. <laughs> But he was an avid reader. He was self-educated. He read everything from, other bi from biographies to war to religion. He wanted to know so much. And I oft often wish he could have left that knowledge behind with me. He was diagnosed with dementia in the early 90s. And it was hard because we kind of watched him leave us little by little. He went into the VA hospital in Maywood, November 16th in 2000. And he passed away December 16th, 2000. Strangely enough, it was 56 years to the day of his capture at the Battle of the Bulge. This is my mom. So mom lived another 13 years. And the last five of her years, she lived with my husband and I. So we had a three-level house, and we had to put a chairlift in for her. And that picture of her is my mother. She just, she's a, she was a hoot. And she enjoyed life up until she died. Here's another picture that you can kind of see how much she enjoyed life. <laughs> this is actually at my friend Ann's uh, dance studio. It was a Halloween party. Mom lived until she died. She had fun wherever she went. She was my best friend. This picture is only four months before she had a fall in our home and was at a nursing home and they actually neglected her and she contracted MRSA and it took her life. And she passed away February 3rd, 2013. So mom and dad's legacy is large. This is pretty much a depiction of our entire family. This was actually at her funeral luncheon. 
So my darling, 99 love letters, how did this all happen? Well, in 95, like I said, mom and dad moved out of the family home and I found, I saw the letters in a filing cabinet as we were packing everything up and I asked my mother what those letters were and she just said, they're my letters. <laughs> I'm like, what letters? And she said, letters from dad and I asked her if I could read them and she said, when I'm gone, you can read them. So after mom died, my sister Lynn, who lived in Colorado, she came home for a visit. And she had a plan to do something with these letters. My sister is, she's a, a retired nurse practitioner. She's 22 months younger than I am. She's an artist, she's a writer, she writes poetry. Every day she posts a poem on Facebook in poetry. So she and a bunch of her friends are artists in Loveland. It's a very artsy community. And they were going to display daddy's letters. Well, of course, I didn't give her the real letters. I made copies for her. <laughs> but she had a project going. So we took out the letters. This is the actual time, the first time we took out the letters. It was an evening where some family members were over and we started reading these letters and we were crying and then laughing and it was just amazing to see my father's words to my mother. They're in the same plastic bag that they were when I saw them originally. So this is my sister, and this is the uh, wheat and grain building in where the display was happening. And that was her display when she had the project and when they had the, uh, the show. And one of the greatest stories that my sister tells about this is how people from all generations came and stood there and read these letters and were crying and they wouldn't leave because they wanted to know more. They wanted to know the full story about what my dad went through. And they all had, what was interesting is they all had their own story too about a family member. So this is so generational, you know, just to talk to your family and find out what what they went through, if you can get it out of them. <laughs> so reading dad's letters changed so many things for me. The way I got to know my father, I got to know him as a boyfriend, a soldier, a guy falling in love. I mean, who gets to, who gets to know that about their parents? And I discovered things about my mom that I never knew, and we were besties. Like she, if I had to go put a lockbox on the house, she was in the seat next to me because she wanted to take a ride. So there was always something my mother wanted to be with the family. She was loyal, generous, and very brave. Which I never knew she was brave until I read these letters and realized what she had to go through. My mom never, ever, ever shared the pain and suffering she went through when dad was missing. But when I think back, and I know how she was with me during an early romance, she showed me in her own way. She got me. So I never in a million years thought I would write a book, and I could, but I could not get these letters out of my mind. They just were all I could think about. So I asked my sister, what do I do? How do I start this project? And she said, just start writing. Write down 15 minutes a day and just keep writing. And then I couldn't stop writing. So it took me about three years to do the complete thing with the beta reads and the proofing and all of that. And this was my book launch. Now you're gonna see <laughs> that I not only have like signs, I also am very, I like dates. So because of COVID, we had a book signing that we were going to do at the Mays Branch Public Library on my parents' anniversary, and we couldn't do it because of COVID. So we went virtual, and we had a virtual book launch. My book came that exact day. So we had it on December 16th, 2020 the 20th anniversary of my dad's passing and the 76th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge. So this is, this is me. Okay, there's no volume, <laughs> guys. <laughs> we'll go back. No. 
Here comes the cavalry. <laughs> I haven't played it yet, you know. It's not, there's no volume. We did test this out already. <laughs> Should I try again? Sorry about that. Okay. Oh my God. This is just me yeah, right. opening the book. She was all right. What did you send me the book? According to this fine spot on Amazon. Oh my God. God. It's so big. This thing is oh like. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like a history oh book. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is so beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so my book signing was June 3rd, 2021, the 77th anniversary of my parents' wedding day. My husband Joe and I at our book signing. I've also been so fortunate to have been featured on quite a few TV and news stations. This happened to be a story that people picked up and the first time I was on TV was on our own Chicago WGN with Marcella Raymond. And Marcel is actually here with me today. Should I point at you? <laughs> she did such a fabulous job with my parents' story that I wanted just to play that for you today. There she is with me. It was a love story kept secret for decades. Bernie Kincannon sent 99 love letters to Mary Runke over three years. Letters filled with hope, love, and fear. And now their daughter has put those letters in a book for the whole world to see. And Marcella Raymond has tonight's story. Darling, at last, after two weeks, I'm able to write to my one and only again. Their love affair began in 1942. And until 1945, Bernie Kincannon wrote 99 letters to Mary Runke. They never shared them with anyone. I asked her what the letters were, and she said, those are my letters. And I'm like, okay, what letters? <laughs> They're letters from Dad. I said, can I read them? And she's like, when I'm gone. Bernie and Mary met while working at a Chicago factory. He was 24, handsome, with an infectious smile. She was 19, a dark-haired beauty who knew exactly what she wanted. My father had no idea what hit him because my mom, my mom was right on that, you know, right on him right away. I will be seeing you in all the old familiar places. They fell deeper in love through letters Bernie began writing when he was a pitcher in the minor leagues connecting from hundreds of miles away. Theirs was a very private love story, sometimes funny and mundane. This afternoon I deposited my poker winnings in the bank. <laughs> I wrote you last night that I won $14.80. <laughs> but always filled with love. I love you so much, Bernie, and I always will. Think about you constantly, so please remember that. I'll be with you in that way always. In November of 1944, Bernie enlisted in the Army. They married in June before he left for Europe. It was World War II, and Bernie was on the front lines. Things over here are in quite a mess, and we can be thankful that we are American. Corporal King Cannon was an ammunition handler. On December 13th, his Army unit was sent to Belgium to the Battle of the Bulge, the last major German offensive on the Western Front. Despite the German defeat, Corporal Kincannon was captured. 
Mary did not hear from him or the War Department for four months. On December 16, 1944, the German attack began, and on 18 December 1944, all communications with the regiment was lost. I mean, can you imagine reading this letter? Bernie didn't know Mary was pregnant. It just had to be just excruciating for her. When the war ended six months later, Bernie came home to his wife and newborn son. He never talked about his experience to his five children. In his letters, he's so demonstrative and he's so like free with his words and loving and that wasn't the dad that I knew. He just, he had more, he had trouble showing his emotions. Bernie King Cannon died on December 16th, 56 years to the day of his capture. Five years after Mary's death, their family sat around the table and opened the aged and yellow letters. We all took turns reading them and we were just like laughing and then crying and then la and then you realized what you had. Do you think they had a good love story, like even without knowing this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had a happy home. So Kathy, the middle child, decided to put the letters in a book, My Darling, 99 Love Letters. The letters have left the family wanting more, so many questions now, and no one to ask. Reading those letters, I'm like, oh my gosh, mother, how could we never have had this conversation? Some things you just want to keep close to your heart. Darling, that is one thing I can hardly wait for. We'll be so very happy when we are together again. A love story for the ages and just in time for Valentine's Day. Marcella Raymond, WGN News. Thank you. My hope is that my parents' story and my book touches the hearts of families that have experienced the heartache of separation from their family members serving our country and to let others know the sacrifice of the men and women at home and away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Let's hear it for Kathy Nosek, guys. Just want to make sure that everyone's aware that we have a copy of Kathy's book available for every veteran in attendance. The tables that are outside where you registered to come in, please grab a book on your way out. At this time, I'd like to present a couple special awards. So I have Kathy on stage. Lorraine, I'd like you to come back up, too, if you wish. So as we customarily do at this event every year, we like to give a couple of our Naperville Response for Veterans Awards out. And we'd like to present the first one to Kathy Nosick for being our featured speaker today. And this is in honor of Corporal Bernie Kincaid, a true American war World War II hero, presented by Naperville Response for Veterans, April 26, 2022. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you. And then next we have, in memory of Tuskegee Airman Melvin Copeland, a true American war hero, presented by Naperville Response for Veterans, April 26, 2022. We'd like to present this to his cousin, Lorraine Shoto. Okay, just a couple quick things here before we get you guys back to the office here, back to your day of work. Uh, I wanted to mention that Naperville is doing a new initiative to honor our veterans. It's called Naperville Salutes. This is a streetlight banner program that I just want to bring to your attention because we do need uh, veterans to go on and give their information, or if you're a family member, please nominate uh, your veteran family member. You can go on Naperville's website, naperville.il.us, and it's backslash naperville-salutes and you'll see information about the banner program. I'm thrilled that the city of Naperville is doing this. These banners will be on display on Memorial Day and, and Veterans Day, and it's gonna be an ongoing program. So please go on the website and check that out. Um, I think we've got some uh, raffles to give away. Hopefully all the veterans that came in got their raffle tickets on the way in. 
So I'm going to read them off, and if you've got a winning ticket, please see our girls at the registration tables on the way out. The first one is 865847. That's 865847. Next, we've got 865882. 865882. 865884. 865884. We have 865874. That's 865874. And lastly, 865842. 865842. Got your winning ticket? Check the uh, registration table on your way out, please. I'll get them down there. Uh, before we wrap up our, our day today, I'd like to thank all the supporters for coming out again. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the major sponsors for this event. Uh, that's Baird and Warner. Thank you, Baird and Warner, for your continued support. <laughs> SNS Active Wear is a new supporter. SNS Active Wear, very generous supporter of this event. We have Scientel Solutions, Nelson Santos in the building. Nelson is a tremendous supporter of veterans and our organization. Thank you, Nelson. And lastly, Bill Hayes, I saw him at some point today. Bill Hayes, Esser Hayes Insurance, Assured Partners. Thank you, Bill, for being a continued supporter. I'd also like to recognize Belgio's Transportation for picking up the Fox Valley guys, another nice ride for the Fox Valley guys, and also Naperville Trolley Tours for picking up our Bolingbroke VFW and American Legion guests. Thank you guys very much. All right. I think that's all the, the business for today. So to take us home, I'd like to welcome the chorus of DuPage. There he is. Oh, please, please take your flowers home with you. OK, please take your centerpiece flowers home with you. And the chorus of DuPage will take us out.